Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Okay, I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God, you need God. So come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord and let's pray together. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. Father, we haven't come into this place to hear from a man. We haven't come into this place to hear from a woman. We have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, protect us, fill us this day. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. But Lord, we would ask you to bless us this day, but also ask you to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're our brothers and our sisters and we love them and consider them and care for them as much as we do ourselves. We ask that you bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary, Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Churches. We thank you for Trinity, Emmanuel Baptist. Thank you for Ecclesia the Way. God, we give you the praise and glory for San Bernardino Temple. Father, thank you that you allow us the privilege of coming to the house of God. Now, Lord, we would ask that you would just draw close to us as we draw close to you. May the word of God become alive to us this day. And we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say, Amen. Amen. Well, take your seat, get your Bible, go with me to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. We go line upon line, precept upon precept. For those of you that are new and you're going with us, you can always grab on wherever we're starting up and learn something. we just so wonderful as the Word of God. I want you to hear what I'm going to say before I give you the title of the message today. I want you to hear because it's important for you to understand that this is the inspired Word of God. You haven't come into this house to hear from a man. You haven't come in to get some ideology or some philosophy or some human understanding about what this is all about. We've come in to hear what the Word of God has to say. Tell you the truth, let me put it in blunt words. I really don't give a flip what men say. I want to find out what God says. And we're going to look into the word of the Lord. Now I've said this a hundred times. I'll say it a thousand more times and I'm saying it for those of you that are new. Listen to me. The word of God describes itself as the hidden mysteries of God. They're hidden because they're hard to find and they're mysteries because they're hard to figure out. Let me give you an illustration. If you ever started to read your Bible and you said, oh my goodness, I don't know what it means. That doesn't make sense. Why is he repeating himself so much? Why has he said that before in the previous book? And you go off and your mind starts to wander. If you can get a hold of the hidden mysteries of God and apply them in your life, you'll be successful in every area of your life. In your marriage, raising your children, in your finances, in your business, relationships, family, everything that you need to be fulfilled in life is found in the manual of life, the B-I-B-L-E. And so when we look at the Word of God, it's really not about a history lesson. Even though there's some old things that took place thousands of years ago that we need to look at today, because we can see either the victory or the failure of those people as examples to us today on what to do and what not to do today in order for us to be successful. We've been looking at the children of Israel. They've been called out of bondage like you were called out of bondage. Jesus set you free. And God wants to take them to their promised land. And there's this promised land there. It's filled with milk and honey, abundance and blessing and peace and rest and joy, security and everything they could possibly want in their promised land. God has a personal promised land 
for each and every one of us that are in here. And it's the exact same story of, for them as it is for us. And as we learn about them, their failures and their victories, we can learn about how we do life so that we can enter into our own personal promised land. You do not get the personal promised land of God by doing life the way you think it's going to work. That comes from the knowledge of the tree of good and of evil where you make decisions for yourself what is right, wrong, what is good and bad. And it's from that moment on that each and every one of us now have to get out of our old thinking and get into the thinking of the Lord. And this is the very inspiration and heartbeat of God pinned for you and I to look at so that we can draw the wisdom and be what God would have us to be and do what God would have us to do and say what God would have us to say and live the way God would have us to live. And it's important for us to look at it because we're looking at examples on how to live life for ourselves so that we can be successful. And so as we study the word of the Lord, I hope you have a Bible, I hope you're making notes. I hope you're writing down little areas of your life so you can see them as the Spirit of God speaks to you about these subjects. I'm going to start off reading the Word of God out of the fourth chapter of Hebrews. The title of the message, if I may say this to you, is Why Christians Fail. I know a lot of people that are going to go to heaven, but while they're here on this planet, they're miserable, down and out, lousy witnesses, broke down, busted, and disgusted. Thank you. That was one of them that used to be that way, I'm sure. (laughs) And for all of us that are in here, we don't want to live that kind of a life. We want to learn how to live our life the way God would have us to live. Even though they're going to go to heaven while they're here on this planet, they are failures in their marriage and failures raising their children and failures in their business and failures in their economics and are always fighting and are always in strife and are always worried and always frustrated and always discontent with everything and are sourpuss and negative about everything in life and they are failures in life even though they call themselves Christians. And you know some of them and don't tell me you don't. I don't want to be that way, and I know you don't want to be that way either. The children of Israel wanted the promised land, but they didn't get it. They thought it would be great to live there, but they never entered in. It was the very promise of God that wanted to take them there. It was the heartbeat of God. It was God caring for them, God loving them, God delivering them, God caring about them, their children. God wanted to bring them to a place of prosperity and success in their life, but they themselves failed on that trip. And as we look at it, man, I don't want to fail, and I know you don't either. There's a personal promised land. God has a plan for your life. And if you understand these simple principles, you'll really grow, really be healthy, really be strong, and end up very prosperous in your life. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. I'm grandpa. Let grandpa teach you something about the Bible and about life. You never had a grandpa ever teach you anything. This grandpa didn't just fall out of the seminary truck and find somebody's teaching on a little cassette tape or CD and teach you something. This grandpa's lived it. Grandma and I have lived it. And I'm telling you it works. I'm standing before you as a living witness that it works. But you gotta listen, you gotta go, you gotta apply, you gotta hear, you gotta want it. Question is today is do you want it? Let's go to the word of the Lord. Hebrews 4, chapter starting, if you will, in verse number 3. For we who have believed do enter that rest. We talked about the rest. The rest is the presence of God. 
The rest is not ceasing from your labor. That's not the rest he's talking about or stopping doing life, just doing nothing, sitting around, waiting for something to happen so you can get back in the track. That's not the rest he's talking about. The rest that he's talking about is finding yourself where there's the presence of God and there's such a presence of God. In the middle of a storm, you're at rest. You'll find Jesus on the boat. He's on the bow asleep of the boat while there's a hurricane or a storm uh, around him. The seas are tossing. The disciples are frustrated. They're half crying because they think they're going to die. And Jesus is in the midst of a sleep and a nap. They wake him up and they say, don't you care about us? We're going to perish. And he speaks to the storm, be still. Why was he asleep in the middle of the storm? Because he was in the presence of the Father. He knew that it would all take place and he knew it was all controlled by God. He knew that God had all under control and God would be able to handle it all. He knew how it was going to work and come out. He knew the plan of God for his life. In the midst of a storm, what's that got to do with it? He's asleep. And that's what the rest he's talking about. And he goes on and he says, and I have said, I have swore by my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest. The reason they didn't enter into their rest is obviously they had gone into unbelief. They heard the word but didn't believe it. They heard the word but didn't put it to work. They heard what they, and they saw with their own eyes the blessings of the Lord, but they didn't get into it. And now God is making a statement. I have said they will not enter into my rest. Although, notice the word although, which is an interesting word. It really means uh, they won't enter into my rest because even though, watch this, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Did you know in your life the works are finished from the foundation of the world that God's got it all under control? He saw you before the foundation of the world. He knows you, knows where you're going, what you're doing. And if you really were in faith and really were trusting God, you would sit back and relax, take a deep breath and be in the presence of God, entering into that rest and letting God be God. And verse number four comes along and it says, as for he who had spoken in a certain place, speaking that certain place being heaven, the seventh day in which this way, that God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. Using that as an illustration that God has already completed the whole thing. Everything that you need, everything that I'll ever need is in place. But none, he goes on and he makes this statement and he says, he says, and again in this special place, or in this heavenly place, they shall not enter into my rest. It was available to them, but they didn't get it. It's available to us, but we might not get it. Because it's available doesn't mean you're going to get it. You can have something available to you and never access it. Never use it, never put it to work. They had the promised land available to them and they, although it was finished from the foundation of the world that they should go into the promised land, they never got it and they failed. Failure is what we're talking about. You see, I figure it this way. If I can see how they failed in the scripture, then I don't do that and I do the opposite, I will be successful. Is that easy to understand? So what I've done is I've taken some failures in the word of God so that we can learn why Christians fail and see them for ourselves. Three out of the mouth of Jesus himself, one out of the mouth of Paul the apostle. And if we can see how people failed in those days, we can see how and what not for us to do today so that we can be successful. Is anybody listening? Why Christians fail. Number one, unbelief. Of course, you see that example here with the children of Israel wanting to go into the promised land but not getting there. Of course, it was unbelief, but you have to understand about belief. I really believe there are levels of faith and belief. 
I really believe there are some people that just do things because it's a thing to do. It's kind of, if you will, mm, you know, it's the traditional way of doing things. They pray because everybody else prays, or they'll sing a song because everybody else sings, or they'll believe God on that traditional level, that ceremonial level, and they never get into the depth of what they're believing God for. And I believe in order for you to get something done, you're going to have to believe God. In fact, you're going to have to look at the problem as smaller than the one who provides the answer. And if you don't see the one who provides the answer as bigger than the problem, the problem will always be there. It'll never go away until you turn it around and realize that God Almighty is bigger than any problem you and I could have. No matter what it is you're facing, no matter how hard it is, no matter how difficult it is, no matter how it doesn't line up with your logic, no matter how crazy it might possibly be, may I say this to you, listen closely, until, listen to the word again, until, one more time, hear the word, until you get to the place where the promise of God is bigger than the problem, you will always have the problem until the promise takes over. They couldn't get out of the problem. They saw the giants in the land, and they never got into the promise, and that's why it kept them from the promised land. You and I have got to be a people of great belief, and that's where our God is bigger. Stop and think about David and Goliath. Here's this young shepherd boy. He doesn't know how to fight anybody. He's been on the hills of Judea singing songs to Jesus, to, to God. And he's singing songs to God on the hills of Judea. He's called by Samuel. He's anointed to be king over Israel. He doesn't even know how to be a king. He's just a young boy. His dad calls him out of the shepherd sheep field and he says, take this cheese and bread to your brothers. They're in a war against the Philistines and see how the war is going. He goes up to the war grounds where his brothers are. There he meets a giant in the land by the name of Goliath. You gotta be kidding me. Here's Goliath. He's almost 10 feet tall. He's full of armor. He's a murdering, crippling, killing machine. In fact, he's so fearful. People are so fearful of him, they run from him. The entire army of Israel sees Goliath and says, oh my goodness, this guy's going to cut me in pieces. And they turn and they run for their lives. And the little David shows up on the scene. He looks And he doesn't see the problem. He only sees the answer. And he looks at the problem and he points to the guys and he looks at Goliath and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the living God? Let me tell you something. Do you know what he just really said? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine means who is this man that has no God when we are the armies of the living God? He picks up his little stones in his pouch bag. The Bible says that he didn't run at Goliath. Did you know that he ran towards the entire Philistine army by himself? How could he do such a crazy thing as that? Because he saw his God bigger than any Goliath there ever will be. And guys, as long as our faith level is down there where we're operating in traditions and rituals and saying the right things and got the right things instead of looking at a problem like this is no problem at all for my God. It's got to go back off, cease and desist. I'm going on with God. What is this uncircumcised problem that defies me? I'm here to tell you that greater is he that's been me than he that's in the world. And that's faith. That's what takes you from down here to up there. That's what takes you from a loser to a winner. That's what takes you from being broke to being rich. That's what takes you from being sick to being healed. That's activating a great and mighty and marvelous God that you have on the inside of you. That's called belief. Let's take a look at it out of the mouth of Jesus. Go with me, if you will, in Matthew, the 17th chapter. Turn to your Bibles, Matthew, the 17th chapter. 
And let's take a look at the verse number 15 of Matthew, the 17th chapter. Jesus is talking. And a man comes up to him and he's got a son who is sick. He's got demons and he's fallen in the fire and fallen in the water. Listen to what the man says to Jesus. Verse 15, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic that suffers severely from often falling into the fire and often into the water. Watch this, verse 16. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Failure! And Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithful and perverse generation, how long will it be with you? And how long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Verse 19 is really fascinating. Verse 19 is these disciples. Now they come to Jesus privately. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? They tried but didn't. They went through the ritual, they went through the ceremony, they went through the whole thing, but there was something on the inside of them lacking. Listen to what Jesus answers. Because of your, verse 20, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say unto you that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, that you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Now listen to these words. And nothing will be impossible to you. Why is nothing impossible to you? Because your God's greater than everything. And in order for you to fail, your God's going to have to fail. That's called belief, not unbelief. My friends, why people fail is because of unbelief. Number two, why Christians fail. Because we hear, but we don't do. And I've said it a dozen times, we can hear and hear and hear and hear and preach it and preach it and preach it and receive it and quote it and still not do it and still fail. I don't know how many times I've spoken this to you and I'll say it again to you. For some of you that are new, listen closely. I've been in counseling for 30 years with people who will tell me about how bad their marriage is and I, I will say, well, here's the problem. You're not doing this and you're not doing this and I'll start to quote scripture to them and they will finish the scripture. I'll start to quote a scripture to her and she will finish the scripture. And I say, man, you guys know this. What's your problem? The problem isn't knowing it. The problem is doing it. That's why, and I hate to use this, and I'm going to preface it by saying, for every lousy pastor there is, there's a thousand good ones. But that's why you hear so often times of pastors who preach the word of God failing, doing stupid things. Because here's why. The truth is this. We're anointed to preach it, but we're not any more anointed to keep it than you are. We got to get in here and do this just like you do. Are you hearing me? And when we think we're above doing it, that's when we fail. And all of us have got to do it. I want you to look at me just for a moment. I've never been fatter in my whole life. I've never had a stomach on me in my life. This is the most disgusting thing. When I put my shirt on this morning, I wouldn't even look in the, sh when I had my shirt off, I wouldn't even look in the mirror. I look like I'm pregnant. I hate it. See, all these years I've learned how to diet. All these years I learned how to count calories. All these years I know what it's going to take in order for me to lose weight. See, I could teach it, I could share it with you, but guess what? Until I do it, you know what that means? Shut your mouth and stop eating. I can teach it, I can count calories, I can be on every weight watching control thing, but until I shut my mouth, do it. Doesn't work. I've been waiting for the magic diet pill forever. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? If you'll send me 1995, I'll send you two packs. <laughs> You've been there. There is no magic to any of this. You've got to hear it, know it, and do what? Do it. It's that simple. Jesus put it like this while you're there in Matthew, the seventh chapter. 
Let's take a look at Matthew, the 7th chapter. In the 17th chapter, just turn forward to the 7th chapter, verse number 26. It says, for everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be likened unto a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And when the rains descend and the floods come and the winds blow and beat on the house, and it will fail, fall. And then listen to this, as great is its fall. Listen to this. Why is it great? Because when you don't do the word of God, it's greater than not doing the word of God. The loss is greater. And that's why he says, and great was the fall. By not doing it, again, listen to what he says. He hears these sayings of mine and does not do them. Failure. It's that simple. The children of Israel fell from the same problem. Unbelief. Hearing it, not doing it. Third one, let's take a look. We're talking about why Christians fail. Here's number three. I like this one. Christians fail because we don't count the cost. There's a cost to everything that you do. Everything that you do. You ought to, you know, do you know you calculate your education? You calculate your finances on a regular basis. You count, calculate your retirement programs. You got your 403B working for your IRA programs, everything else working for you. You calculate everything. You calculate Social Security. You calculate the price of gas. You calculate everything. But we fail to calculate what God has for us in the future. How do you know where to go if you're not calculated out on how to get there? And because we don't count the cost, when the cost comes up, we come up short. Debbie and I are in a business adventure. You know, who wants to start a business at my age? I don't, but I feel like God wants me to. We've counted the cost. Uh, we've got this, we've got that, we can do this, we can do that. We've checked with the government, checked with the people, checked with everything, so checked the market out, got all that done, counted the cost. There's one cost we didn't put in that we need to put in. We're not taking another step until God gets in with us. Like God spoke to Moses, Moses, I'll go with you in the promised land. Moses smart enough to say, I'm not going into the promised land until you do go with us. Make sure you go or we're not going. He's so stupid, he listened to the people and listened to God. God already told him he was going into the promised land, but the people spoke louder and he listened to the people instead of listening to God. In other words, in your calculation of your life, two plus two makes four. But guess what? When you bring God into it, two plus two is whatever God says. And you've got to count the cost the right way. It's not just in the natural. Because if you count the cost in the natural and leave God out, God will stay out and you will fail. But if you count the cost in the natural and bring God in, now you've got the natural and the super working together brings you to a place of supernatural results. Is anybody listening? And what we'd fail to do is we fail to count the cost. I'm going to do this with my kids. I'm going to do this with my kids. I'm going to do this with my wife. I'm going to do this. And then you'd fail to figure out what it's going to cost you by doing those things. Down the road, your kids are going to fail. Your wife's going to fail. This is going to fail. You didn't count at the cost. You're going to end up in divorce court. You're going to end up miserable. Let me tell you something. This is what it's all about. You don't count the cost. We ought to count the cost on everything we do and then bring God into the equation and you will be successful. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. I like what Jesus says in Luke, the 14th chapter. Go there with me. Is anybody listening this morning? Are, are you okay with me? Do you still like me? I still like you. And, and Jesus is speaking in Luke, the 14th chapter. In verse number 28, he says this, For which of you intend to build a tower and does not sit down first and count the cost? Whether he has enough to finish it. At least after that he has laid the foundation and it is not able to finish and all who see it begin to mock him saying this man began to build but he was not able to finish failure count the cost in everything that you do count the cost when you call yourself a Christian count your cost when you lay out your life count your cost when you do this and do that count your cost and then add God to the equation that makes it all work. You need a chief financial officer and you need a good Jew. And his name is Jesus. 
Is anybody listening to me? You don't want to do business with anybody else but Jesus. That's the best partner you'll ever have. Bring him into your counting of your costs. Is anybody listening? We're talking about why Christians fail. We know they fail because of unbelief. We know they hear the word but don't do it. We know they don't count the cost. But I like number four. We live carnal lifestyles. We live according to the flesh instead of the spirit. The flesh leads us. The flesh determines where we're going. The flesh helps us to make decisions. When I see the word carnal, I know that a lot of you don't know what that means, so I'll explain it to you, what it means. I've explained it before. It's kind of fun, but I'll use these terms. You'll never forget it. The word carnal is a word that means fleshly. It's where meat comes from. For an example, when you buy a can of chili con carne, that's chili and meat. So the word carnal here means meathead. <laughs> when you live by your own fleshly thinking, you're a meathead. And I don't know why you would ever live by your own fleshly thinking when you have the Spirit of God on the inside. What is the Spirit of God on the inside supposed to be for if you don't use the Spirit of God that is on the inside? And you don't need to be a meathead always making decisions based on your feelings or the flesh or what other people say or the economy or the politicians of our day or what we know in education. We need to make spiritual insights by making spiritual decisions instead of living by the flesh, we live by the spirit. He who lives by the flesh will die, but he who lives by the spirit will live on and be successful. And we need to slow down the flesh and stop and make decisions by the Spirit. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, starting in verse number 11. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You can lay other foundations in the flesh, but the one that's going to be successful is Jesus Christ. It's already been laid for you and you don't need to build on anything else but Jesus, but you can't do it unless you're going to stay in the spirit and do it. Verse number 12, now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble, notice he has two kinds of uh, instruments. You build, and when he builds, he describes it as gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw. Old King James says stubble. If anyone builds on the foundation, so what he just said is you can build in the spiritual or you can build in the flesh. You say, wait a minute, I don't see that there. Do you see this here, gold, silver, precious stone? That's the spiritual. You see the flesh, wood, hay, and stubble, or straw? That's the flesh. I'll prove it to you. Next verse, pop it up, verse number 13. Each one's works will become clear whether it's flesh or spirit, watch this, for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's works on what sort it is. Verse number 14, if anyone's works which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. Watch this, verse 15. If anyone's works is burned up, he will suffer loss. Failure! but himself will be saved, yet he's also through the fire. In other words, when fire hits gold, silver, precious stones, that's the eternal stuff you do by the Spirit, it'll last. When fire hits wood, stay in stubble, wood, hay, and stubble, guess what it does? It burns up. That's what he's saying. Verse number 16 comes along right after this verse and he says this, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? 
In other words, you have the ability in your life to build that which is eternal by listening to the Spirit and following the spiritual ways of doing things, not just the fleshly ways. The fleshly ways seem like good things, but they're not. And we oftentimes make decisions in our life based on what I feel, think, or what someone else does instead of hooking into the Spirit of God and finding out what God would have us to do by the Word of the Lord. You check it out. Four things today that are fun. Why Christians fail. One, unbelief. We're working on that. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two, we hear but we don't do. We're working on that. Somebody say amen. amen. We don't count the cost, but we're working on that. Amen. We live carnal lifestyles, but we're working on that. Amen. And in the meantime, we stay in love with each other, and so we start to develop these characteristics on the inside of us because God wants to take you and I into our own personal promised land. If God spoke to you today, give the Lord a great big praise. Thank you, Lord. I want to talk to you just for a moment. Nobody get up, nobody leave. Give me this opportunity to make sure everybody's all right with God. You know, the Bible says, I will stand before God and I will give an account. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I haven't always done everything right, but I'm trying. One thing I'm going to do is I'm going to be faithful to making sure if there's people in front of me that I'm going to do the very best I can to make sure they're going to heaven. One of the great tragedies in American churches is a lot of people attend church on a regular basis that are going to go to hell. How sad is that? I want to make sure you're going to heaven. I want to ask you a question. And I want you to answer the question in your heart. Nobody will know but you and God. Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building, your heart stopped and you died, bang! Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? That's the question. Just answer that question in your heart. Don't just stare at me. Answer the question in your heart. And let's talk about your answer because it says a lot about where you're at. Some of you said, well, Pastor Jim, I, I think... I think I'd go to heaven. The problem with that is there's nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you said, well, I hope I'm going to make it to heaven. I hope, Pastor Jim. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to hope your way into heaven. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, I, I want you to know I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. But can I tell you something that's not in the Bible? Nowhere in the Bible it said because you love God, you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. Don't you think it'd be in the Bible telling you that's how you get to heaven? Some of you might say to yourself, well, Pastor Jim, you listen, I'm a really good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm good. Guess what? Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good. You're not going to make it. Nowhere in the Bible. Does it say because you're good, you get to go to heaven? You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Let's talk just for a moment. Jesus tells us exactly how to get to heaven in the word of the Lord. He says these words, you must be born again, John 3rd chapter. You can't get there because your mom and dad told you you're a Christian. You can't get there because you're a nice person or a good person or sweet or kind. You're only going to get there because you're born again. What a lot of people don't know in American church, they don't know what born again means. Let me tell you what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. Now listen to me. I want the audience to settle down and listen to me. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus. All or nothing. Very important. I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking. He says, I'm coming again and don't you know he is? We just don't know when. Maybe tonight and I want you ready if he is coming tonight. 
He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. What did he just really say? Listen to me now. He just said people that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. They're going to get vomited from the mouth of Jesus. What's lukewarm? Little in, little out. Let me define it for you. A little up, a little down. Lukewarm. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. Hey, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. That's lukewarm. God is something in your life, but he's not everything in your life. That's lukewarm. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking to you. Today is your day of salvation. Today is time to give God all of your heart. Give God all of your life. You notice how I emphasize the word give? He won't steal it from you. He's not a crook. He's not a thief. He's not a conniver to talk you out of or a manipulator to make you do it. You're going to have to give him all of your heart. You're going to have to give him all of your life. Today is your day of salvation. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. You don't understand, I joined my last church. It was a Christian church. I was there for 20 years. Sang in the choir, helped the pastor out as a leader. Could you show me in the Bible? Well, that'll get you to heaven. I'm glad you did all those things, but you could do all that until you die and still go to hell because you must be born again. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. The only way to get to heaven Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't get there your way, my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get there his way. And he said, you must be born again. And born again means you've got to give him all of your heart. You've got to give him all of your life. You might say to me, well, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Well, let's do it God's way. Is that okay? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! Just like that, you'll hear the sound. Bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand. All across the back, all across the family rooms that are filled in the foyer right now, I'm speaking to you down there at the restaurant, Love Rock restaurant. I'm talking to you down there at Kuka's restaurant. I'm talking to you, put the burrito down, get your hand up, get ready to go. I'm talking to you out in the courtyard. I'm talking to you under the plaza that are listening to me right now, right before God. When I pop my hands together, you get your hand up. God's watching right now, and you make that statement from your heart that you're going to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Today, all across this auditorium, it's your day of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? Get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. If you're not sure, make sure. Get ready to put your hand up. You say, Pastor, wait a minute. I'll be embarrassed if I put my hand up. I'll feel funny. Yep, get over it. It's better to feel funny for a moment and be embarrassed for a moment than to be in hell forever and ever and ever because you're afraid of what people think instead of what God sees. Today, it's your day of salvation. I've done my job. I've told you the truth. Now I'm going to pop my hands together and sit there and do nothing and go to hell or get your hand up and let's go for God. But don't raise your hand unless you are ready to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Don't give me this religious stuff. You're just doing it because everybody else is doing it. Do it because you really want to change and want to give God all of your heart and all of your life. I'm finished. Here it is. I'm popping my hands together. Get ready. Are you ready? One, two. Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Thank you, back over here. Anybody on this side, thank you. All, all, come on, anybody on this side? There's ten back over here. Let's go, there's eleven. Thank you, got two hands up. God bless you. There's twelve, thirteen, back of the family. There, there's fourteen right back over here. There's fifteen, sixteen back on this far side. There's seventeen right there. God bless you. I got you back over on this side. Eighteen, I think I may have counted you already, but I'll count you twice because I love numbers. There's some more people. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's 18. There's 19. Thank you. Where's 20? Where are you? 20. You need to get your hand up. Any, there's 20. Raise your hand twice. There's 20. 21 back there. Thank you. God bless you. 21. What? What's everybody unsaved on that side, right? This side, I just sit back and say, oh, the heathens sit on that side, right? I don't think so. Who's on this side? You know you need to get right with God. There's at least, at least 11 of you. How do I know that? Spirit of God just spoke to me. Anybody else? Real quick, you need to get your hand up. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Listen, check with your neighbor right now. 
Give them a smack in the face and say, you don't want to miss this. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, I think there's like 21. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Woo! Okay, here's what I want you to do. All 21 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Check with your neighbor right now. Nudge your neighbor and say, if you need to go, I'll go with you. I always, someone says that, I always say that to Debbie, and she always gives me a look like. And so, listen, check with your neighbor. All 21 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friends, get your stuff, get in the aisle, meet me in front. No one leaves during this period of time. It's rude for you to leave. Let's let the people come forward, and then I'll dismiss you in just a few moments. Let's stand and welcome the people as they come. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, from this side, you can come, you know it. You need to come, just come. Yeah, they're coming. Come on, come on, you can come too. good. Praise God. Well, I want you all to look to your left. See this guy running over here? Because he's trying to do something. I don't know what he's doing. He's the nicest guy in the whole world. His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a good, get down. Pastor Dave is a good guy. Get off my platform. And uh, he's not that good. And uh, <laughs> I want you to go with him because he's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you, give you some free information, introduce you to a program we have that will help you stay strong called Spiritual Personal Trainers. That's with somebody you meet before church, a friend to help you keep on going. We don't want you to go back doing the same stuff, falling through the cracks. We care about you to meet you before church service. Just spend some money. Let us spend some money on you. Amen. If you'll come back, we'll do that because we care about you and love you. We want to see your future and success and you're worth the investment. So let us help you to do that so that you don't go back, fall through the cracks. Let's go on with Jesus. You're going to give God all your heart, all your life. Let's go for it. Come on, make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Thank you, Pastor Dave. <laughs>